Hi, and welcome back. So in this video, I'm going to review a study where researchers have found out that the time of day that you actually exercise is an important factor in lowering both all-cause and cardiovascular mortality. Now, when I was working full-time, the time of day that I could exercise, apart from the weekends, was pretty much dictated by my working hours. Now I'm semi-retired and most of my working day very soon will be spent in the gym we are building. Being able to reduce my chance of death from cardiovascular disease and all-cause mortality just by working out at a specific time is actually a bit of a no-brainer. The value of physical activity for health and also longevity is unquestionable. Even if some doubts remain about its optimal composition, that means what you actually do, and the quantity, so the amount of times that you do it. There will be social media influencers and personal trainers that will try to convince you that a particular type of exercise conducted in a certain way for a specific length of time or a specific number of repetitions or sets is going to be optimal for your personal goal. And by adding a specific pre-workout drink or post-workout shake or gummy or supplement will positively enhance the effect of their exercise choice on you attaining your goal. And obviously, they will have access to the specific products that you need for a reasonable price. That said, at present, very little is known about the effect of daily exercise timing. So what time of day is actually best? Given the choice, I would prefer to wake up at 6 a.m., clean my teeth, not shower, get dressed, and then head straight to the gym or start my bike ride or start my run. What about you? Do you prefer to train in the morning, the afternoon, or the evening? Anyway, back to the study. This new study on exercise timing was published in the journal Nature Communications. This study, like many others, uses the trove of health information stored in the UK Biobank database. This is a huge open repository of health data. In addition to the more conventional information, such as blood work and dietary patterns, the UK Biobank database also contains data on about 100,000 UK residents who agreed to wear sophisticated accelerometers consistently for seven days. This data enables researchers to precisely determine exercise intensity and also the timing. It also covers physical activity that is not part of a structured exercise regimen. Here, we're talking about activities such as carrying the groceries, climbing the stairs, doing housework, gardening, etc. This is something that similar exercise-related studies are sorely lacking in. In this study, the researchers divided their participants into four separate groups by prevalent timing of their MVPA. This stands for moderate to vigorous physical activity. This refers to any activity that raises your heart rate and also your breathing. The use of MVPA is a key concept in health and fitness because it directly supports things like cardiovascular health, metabolic function, and overall physical well-being. Moderate activities typically include things like brisk walking, water aerobics, and slow cycling. Vigorous activities raise the intensity higher and include running, swimming laps, playing basketball, or fast cycling. Both levels of activity have significant health benefits, such as lowering your blood pressure, improving your cholesterol levels, supporting weight management, and reducing the risk of chronic diseases like type 2 diabetes, cancer, osteoporosis, dementia, and also heart disease. Heart disease remains the leading cause of death worldwide. According to the World Health Organization, cardiovascular diseases, which include heart attacks, strokes, and other heart-related conditions, are responsible for an estimated 17.9 million deaths every year, accounting for approximately 32% of all deaths worldwide. Current health guidelines generally recommend that adults aim for at least 150 to 300 minutes per week of moderate intensity activity or 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous intensity activity or a combination of both. MVPA is also important for mental health as regular sessions can reduce symptoms of depression and also anxiety. Depression and anxiety are common but frequently go undiagnosed in older adults. These mental health issues often become chronic when compounded by physical illness, such as heart disease and even diabetes. Social isolation, bereavement and loss of independence further increase the risk of persistent depression and anxiety. Addressing these conditions early through support networks, therapy and sometimes medications. These can greatly improve the quality of life in aging populations. Incorporating 
MVPA into your routine does not necessarily mean you have to start any type of formal exercise. It can include activities like hiking, dancing, or even energetic household chores, as long as the intensity level reaches moderate or vigorous. Consistency over time is key to reaping the full health benefits of MVPA. As well as the intensity of the exercise, the researchers analyzed the time of day. This was the main aim of the study and was recorded as either morning, midday or afternoon, evening, and also whether these timings were mixed. The mean follow-up period of this study was seven years. So let's cut to the chase. What were the results? Firstly, and unsurprisingly, the data confirmed yet again that physical activity is associated with massively reducing mortality. Interestingly, and largely in line with other recent studies, the association increased rapidly between 0 and 150 minutes of MVPA per week. It plateaued at around 200 minutes per week. This was true for the three types of mortality that were considered during the study. Those being all causes, cardiovascular and also cancer. For cardiovascular mortality, a massive fourfold reduction was observed. The effect was weaker, but still remarkable for cancer also. The main result, however, was that people who had the lion's share of their MVPA either in the morning or in the evening seemed to attract a smaller reduction in all-cause and cardiovascular mortality than those who exercised mostly during midday and afternoon or their hours were mixed, even in models adjusted for numerous potential confounding variables. Variables such as age, sex, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, education levels, diet, smoking, alcohol intake, sleep quality, and total MVPA volumes. The midday and afternoon group showed a 28% reduction in cardiovascular mortality, whilst the mixed group hours showed a 26% reduction in cardiovascular mortality. This was when it was compared to the morning group. The evening group results were largely similar to those of the morning group. The difference for all-cause mortality was also significant, but it wasn't for cancer mortality. These associations were held even after numerous sensitivity analysis, and they were more pronounced for older people, for men, for people with existing cardiovascular conditions, and for those who were physically less active. Speculating about the possible mechanisms behind these results, the researchers mentioned the circadian differences in cardiometabolic reactions to physical exercise, that were uncovered in previous studies. For example, one study showed faster recovery of systolic blood pressure after exercise had taken place in the late afternoon. This was when compared to early morning. This was consistent with a stronger effect shown in people with existing cardiovascular conditions. Another study found that post-meal walking improved glucose control more effectively than walking in the morning or walking in the afternoon. Like all population studies, this study could not establish causation. And as with other studies, it was prone to contamination by numerous potentially confounding variables. Population and epidemiological studies are essential for understanding patterns of health and disease, but they come with numerous significant limitations. One major problem is confounding, where other variables not accounted for influence the observed relationship between exposure and also the outcome. For example, a study might suggest that drinking coffee reduces heart disease risk, but the real factor could be the coffee drinkers tend to do more exercise. Bias is another critical issue, including selection bias, where the participants chosen are not representative of the general population. And then there's recall bias, where the participants don't accurately remember all of their past behaviors. Causality is a huge challenge in epidemiology. Observational studies can show associations, but they cannot prove that one factor causes another. Randomized controlled trials are needed for stronger evidence, but they are often impractical or unethical for many public health reasons. Measurement errors are another problem. Inaccurate self-reporting of things like diet, exercise, medication use, etc. can distort the findings. Publication bias further skews the field as studies with positive findings are far more likely to be published than those that show no effect at all. While epidemiological studies provide valuable insights and they do generate certain hypotheses, their results must be interpreted very carefully indeed, often requiring multiple studies, different methodologies, and biological plausibility 
to draw any reliable conclusions. This study also had design limitations in that the participants only wore their accelerometers for seven days. This might be enough to capture weekly activity patterns, but not long-term changes in their physical activity. On the other hand, the study implemented some robust safeguards and presented some very convincing results. And these should really be explored further to confirm the findings. Now, as far as can be established, this large cohort study provides the first evidence that MVPA is associated with lower risks of all cause, cardiovascular disease and cancer mortality, regardless of the time of day. Now, another interesting finding was that the midday and afternoon and the mixed MVPA groups when compared to the morning groups, showed substantially decreased all-cause and cardiovascular disease mortality risk, but not for cancer mortality. The associations between MVPA timing and mortality risk were independent of socio-demographic factors, lifestyle, comorbidities, sleep duration, sleep midpoint, and total MVPA volume. The findings were robust to multiple testing corrections and also sensitivity analyses. In addition, the observed protective effects of MVPA timing were more pronounced among the elderly, the men, the less active individuals, or those who already had pre-existing cardiovascular disease. Now, while the effects of sleep timing and eating are drawing most of the attention, the timing of physical activity is not as well researched. So, the results of this study seem to suggest that the time of day we exercise may be just as important as the exercise we do and for how long we actually do it. But are the one size fits all lazy government recommendations really relevant for everyone? There's no breakdown by sex or by age. Now, let me know, do you think there should be? And as for the recommendation, is more exercise actually better? And if so, how much more? All good questions, but don't hold your breath for an answer from any government anytime soon. Now, as I said earlier, I do prefer to train as early as possible. So, on the strength of this study, should I change my current exercise regimen? Remember, it was an epidemiological study, so no causation. It wasn't necessarily the midday training group that resulted in better mortality rates. I suppose I could try changing my training to midday. I can't check if it will affect my mortality, but I will be able to check and see if I feel different, either better or worse. Now, if I do change, it won't be until we've opened the new gym that we're building. I'm not going to drive the kids to school. That takes 35 minutes. Then I'd have to drive back home. That takes another 35 minutes. And then back again at midday to actually train. The gym is about five minutes away from the school. As with most gyms around the world, they're busy first thing in the morning. And then they're pretty much empty from about 9 a.m. till about four or five in the afternoon. And I do need to remember that what I'm doing here is actually an experiment. So just because I prefer to train in the morning doesn't mean I shouldn't be open to training after midday. Now, I could wait for more studies to come out. A clinical study looking into mortality rates based on the time of day that people train would be absolutely fantastic, but it would be impossible. There would be far too many confounding factors that would need to be considered. And it would need to be a study that started at birth and continued to death with many, many follow-ups along the way. And to be sure, it would then need to be conducted at least once more. So if it were started today, it would take two generations to finish. Now, we know that the things that help prevent cardiovascular disease, cancer, etc., are diet, exercise, overall sleep, alcohol consumption, chronic stress, sleep quality, obesity, inflammation, etc. And what if all of these factors were as good as they can be for both me and you? What effect do you think training or switching training to midday would realistically have? What would be the quantifiable reduction in risk for, say, cancer? Would it be days or would it be years? I'd be interested to see what you think. If training first thing in the morning is best for you, but you could train after midday, but doing so would stress you out or negatively affect some other elements of your life, would the benefit of training after midday actually then be cancelled out? 